Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Don. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's also always a pleasure to speak with Bruce. Uh, what's interesting is Bruce and I have been talking on these topics, well, on and off together for 10, 15 years now. But uh, more recently, we've been doing a series of talks, not always by design, but at times by coincidence. And we have another one on Monday or Tuesday. Monday. <laughs> um, and uh, often on slightly different topics. And what's, what's fascinating is actually to look where we agree and disagree. So I think I could say with some foreknowledge that I'm going to present the glass half empty, or excuse me, glass half full side of the equation, and Bruce will be uh, more on the empty side. I will try to keep my remarks reasonably short, just looking at some of the familiar faces in this audience. I know that there's tremendous expertise here in this room, and I suspect among many of the unfamiliar ones, uh, there's also a tremendous amount. Uh, so part of why I think I'm certainly concerned about the terrorism threat, but perhaps less so than many others, is if I kind of go back in my own mental mindset to September 12, 2001, right? And uh, to focus uh, primarily on the terrorism threat to the U.S. homeland for now, um, there were tremendous fears and concerns on that day, right? And many of them in hindsight, I'll stress hindsight, uh, turned out to be overstated. And so a lot of why I asked myself is simply why were those fears overstated? And when I, when I do that analysis in my own mind, I come out with what I feel are some, some general good news on the counterterrorism side. And I'll talk about that in my remarks. And then I'll talk a little bit about a contrast between Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State and give you a sense of the, my sense of threat and uh, what we should do. So one huge shift that's tremendously important and often underappreciated is after 9-11, a worldwide counterterrorism machine went into gear and has been worrying at high speed ever since. Right, where there are problems with liaison services, there are problems with coordination. We could spend multiple sessions talking about the problems with this. But it is night and day between the pre and post 9 11 eras, where there was tremendous global cooperation in a way that has led to the apprehension of thousands of suspected terrorists. And it's truly quite impressive. If you go back before 9 11, Ayman al Zawahiri fundraised in the United States. Right? He came to the United States to fundraise. Right? I you could never say there's going to be perfection, but I think that would not happen today. Right? I think that would be far harder for him to do that. Um, in general, before 9-11, the FBI was not focused on jihadist terrorism in the United States. Right? It's not a black or white picture, but tremendous difference. Around the world, if you look at London, we used to talk about Londonistan, right? the tremendous jihadist presence that was openly operating out of London. Right? Again, very different picture. And there we've had complaints on the jihadist side where their internal correspondence will talk about the whole world has become the CIA. Um, another shift is I just want to say a, little, a particular plug uh, for the uh, UAV program and for the, the Taliban, or excuse me, for the Predator and uh, Reaper programs and their various incarnations. Right? These programs aren't perfect, but what they've enabled is real time targeting to the point where it's much harder for terrorist groups to have havens in areas where they don't control the airspace or are able to have some freedom in the airspace. So particularly in Pakistan, uh, there have been huge blows. And again, I don't want to make it, it sound like these programs are perfect. They kill innocent people. Uh, terrorist groups still could operate under them. But in addition to killing suspected terrorists in large numbers, they also force the other side to play defense. And in doing so, become far less effective. In order to avoid these strikes, you have to be careful about talking on the phone. You can't meet in large groups. You have to take all these defensive measures that, in the end, makes it far harder to lead and run a global terrorist organization. And so there have been innovations in technology and innovations in how you use technology that have shaped things. Um, now to kind of talk very briefly about the different groups, because I think this distinction is important when we think about the threat today. If you think about Al-Qaeda, what was it about, what was it trying to do? Um, it's using terrorism for a number of purposes. One is to try to force the United States to withdraw from the Middle East, and in general, to create a high price for any occupations, and to rouse Muslims, kind of classic terrorism tactic of trying to inspire through violence itself and through the U.S. Re uh, reaction. But they're also building a movement, and that movement they're trying to proselytize, they're trying to train, and they're trying to win over the people and use the people they train to go back and do terrorist attacks. The Islamic State overlaps with this to some degree, 
but has a very different focus. Uh, its primary focus is on building an Islamic state. Right? And as such, it is regionally focused. It wants to govern. It's trying to create law and order. It has a bureaucracy. It has a tax code. And a lot of what is, I think, legitimately called terrorism is about advancing that state. And much of what they do is really <coughs> conventional warfare. Right? They have a military. Some of it's unconventional warfare, we'll call it guerrilla warfare. And a small part of it is terrorism. Now, a small part of a big organization is still significant. But most of what it's doing is not, as we traditionally define it, terrorism. And its strategy is very much about that state. It wants to consolidate that state and it wants to expand that state. And it uses the resources it gains primarily to advance that state. And as a result, I would say that fighting the Islamic State is different. Uh, one of the biggest sources of the Islamic State's success is that it's successful. Right? And I realize that's just a bit of a tautology. But a lot of why people flock to it is because it's an organization that has created a perception that it's a winner. And as a result, setting it back militarily can have disproportionate effects. Right, because you can dispel that capability. And this is particularly important because it relies very heavily on foreign fighters for much of its personnel. And therefore, its recruiting base is more susceptible to, I'll say, disruption by discrediting the group. Right? So these are people who see it in some ways as a winner and as such are attracted to it. Um, and fighting it, in a way, I would say is... Um, is actually quite straightforward, even though it's exceptionally difficult. Uh, we know how to beat a state. Right? We know how to beat conventional forces. We know how to push them back. Uh, their forces are pretty good by the standards of the Syrian civil war, but that's an extremely low bar. Right? Reasonably competent forces can push them back. Um, and we've seen this in Iraq, where I would say forces that are rather low competence, when paired with US air power, have been very successful in pushing them back. The problem, though, is the what next question, right? which is, I think, one of the few lessons we can say with certainty over the last 15 years is that it's very dangerous to create power vacuums. And so it's quite possible to push the Islamic State back, but they're going to continue fighting with uh, guerrilla warfare in particular, and it's unclear what takes their place. And uh, a colleague of mine at both Brookings and Georgetown, Ken Pollock, uh, he uses a term I like, which is catastrophic success. Right, which is there can be significant military advances on the ground without significant political advances that enable a consolidation of power of an alternative system. And to me, that's a real vulnerability, which is thinking less about the military challenge and more about the political challenge. Um, and you know, uh, President Obama has neglected his daily phone call with me, so I can't give you the latest. But my sense of why he's been reluctant to intervene more in Syria is that no one can answer the question, what comes next? Right? So we go in, we push back the Islamic State, we kill their leaders, defeat their forces, and then we what? Right? And that's a very difficult question, and unfortunately I don't think anyone has come up with a particularly good answer to it. Um, and I think one thing that is, is worth pointing out is part of the reason I think that the Islamic State has become more regional and international lately is because they've had setbacks on the ground in Iraq in particular. And if part of their, their story is that they're a success and they want to maintain an image of success, they're going to need successes elsewhere if they're pushed back in a conventional way. I, mean, I still think it's worth pushing them back, but we have to recognize that there are going to be trade-offs. Um, another thing that makes me slightly more optimistic than Bruce is looking at the foreign fighter issue. Uh, the foreign fighter issue, let's be clear, it's quite bad that thousands of people are going to Iraq and Syria to fight. And there's no question about that. Um, and there, but there are a lot of reasons I think this would be of concern, but of a little less concern perhaps than the Afghanistan flow. Uh, one is, of course, that I mentioned that the Islamic State is primarily focused on the region. So most of the foreign fighters are consumed in the regional conflict. But when you're attracting tens of thousands, even relatively small percentages going back have a huge impact. Right? The numbers, the numbers are staggering. Um, the other thing I would stress here, though, is the shift in the security services. When people were coming back from Afghanistan in the 90s, and no one was paying attention, no one cared. Right? That's not true today. Right? Um, I actually have a, a significant, a serious question, which is, are there more people in the U.S. government tracking jihadist groups 
then there are jihadists. And I don't know, right? It depends how you define jihadist, in part it depends how you define U.S. government person, right? But uh, it used to be there were a handful of people, literally a handful, working on these issues in the whole U.S. government. Uh, now it's tens of thousands, right? Uh, variously defined. So we, the good news to me is we actually do get something for our tax dollars, right? You have a lot of people who are very skilled and very smart going after this problem. So even though I think the problem is significant, I think the response is actually much more impressive than it used to be. Um, we still have, this doesn't solve the lone wolf problem. Right? It's extremely difficult to stop. Something like the San Bernardino killers to me was exceptionally difficult to stop. Right? Uh, it, often lone wolves make more mistakes and give themselves away in more, or more amateurish. Uh, but that was extremely difficult. So there's still going to be problems. And we'll still have occasional successes. Paris being the most horrible, painful example. But there's a question simply of how many. Right? And how to think about the prevalence of that. Um, the danger, I think, is far greater when we talk about U.S. interests in the Arab world. Here, the foreign fighter problem is overwhelming. Right? You're talking an order of magnitude greater, and you're not talking the same level of institutional competence. Um, you often have into situations where conflict is ongoing. So when Libyan people come back, they're coming back to a civil war, and they're able to exploit and divert that civil war. Conclude by saying just a few uh, random points. Um, you know, one is the obvious need for intelligence sharing. This is actually a rather boring recommendation because I think everyone agrees on it. But that this is something that should be prioritized and recognized as a priority. Um, I would also argue in the United States uh, that there have been some failures. And I talked in general that this is a good news story. Uh, let me talk about three failures. Um, one is that I think the bigotry we've been seeing uh, towards Muslim Americans actually creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right, that when we start to see, when we start to have communities that are demonized, then they have basic questions, which is, can we trust our government? And can we trust our neighbors to do the right thing? And even if people are not radicalized, they're less likely to report radicals in their midst. Right, so after 9-11, the vast majority of suspected terrorists in the United States were rounded up because of, ta of uh, tip-offs from uh, community members. There's a danger of jeopardizing that. That, to me, is quite, should be quite scary. And I worry that the extremely hostile rhetoric that's come out in the last several years is going to make this problem much worse. Um, a second failure has been institutionalization. Right? And this is something that a lot of the issues, uh, whether it's, say, uh, Guantanamo we're seeing now, or wiretapping, or um, questions on target killings, there is a real question of you know, what are the appropriate policies? And where are the lines? And to me, this is actually something for legislation. And I, I'm going to go out on a limb in my political predictor mode and say that sometime in the next 25 years, we're going to have a conservative president and sometime we're going to have a liberal one. Right? And we want a policy that is able to extend across both those administrations. And that requires things to be institutionalized, and it's a very painful task, but I do think we have not stepped up to this somewhat incredibly. Um, and the last thing is that I would say that we've had a resilience failure that I think we're actually more nervous and more concerned about terrorism as individuals than we were in the past, um, even though, you know, if you include 9-11, uh, the figures I have at least, is that um, through, from 1970 to 2013, your chances of dying uh, from a terrorist attack were roughly one in four million. Right? This is Americans in the U.S. homeland, right? One in four million. Right? Yet there's tremendous, overwhelming political concern about this. In my degree, even though I work on this and find it important, I think it's often exaggerated. Right? And if you take out 9-11, you're talking 1 in 90 million. Right? 9-11 was an off-the-charts outlier in many ways. Um, yet, and I don't think we've had a recognition of this, and I think the result the terrorist job get, gets easier. Right? That because we're afraid, it's easier to make us afraid. And I feel that even though in general we've had some tremendous successes, these are some things we can work on in the years to come. Thanks very much, Don, and to Double I Double S uh, for this invitation. I think this is the second or the third time that we've you know, been, been paired because we have different views. We paired on foreign fighters, mm -hmm. and now it's on overall policy. And I think next week we're going to be paired with with different views <laughs> on the possibility of an Al Qaeda and ISIS merger or reunification. So I'll give my pitch, and then you can guess which side I'm on that, on that particular <laughs> issue. And probably there'll be some other occasion where Dan and I will, will uh, discuss that.
In fact, you don't have to listen to me. You just have to look at uh, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, James R. Clapper's uh, testimony to the Senate Armed Services Committee of uh, a couple of weeks ago. And you can see, I mean, he was quite explicit, the very serious straits we are in and a threat that has not only um, escalated but certainly become more uh, geographically diffuse and more diverse, at least in terms of adversaries. Uh, it was only five years ago when everyone in Washington was talking about the strategic collapse of al-Qaeda or its impending uh, strategic collapse. And yet you look at uh, General Clapper's testimony, and he talks about 2016 as being a year for new and sustained growth, not by ISIS, but by al-Qaeda and its affiliates. And then he turns to ISIS and describes how ISIS has become the preeminent threat, terrorist threat facing the United States. Well, two years ago, ISIS really didn't exist. It didn't exist in a form that it was certainly a preeminent terrorist threat to the United States or indeed to international and regional stability. So right there, I think we're in a very uh, worrisome uh, situation. Uh, General Clapper also referred to a foreign fighter population uh, that's migrated to Syria and Iraq, about 36,500 persons. Brent McGurk used the same figure earlier uh, today. It was in a transcript that was released earlier today by the State Department. <laughs> That in and of itself is astonishing. Think back to October. Uh, the United States House of Representatives Committee on Homeland Security issued a very detailed report on foreign fighters. And they had pegged the number at only 25,000. Some, somehow it's jumped up 11,500 in the past four months. Uh, the House of Representatives uh, report talked about foreign fighters being recruited from some 80 countries throughout the world. Uh, Brett McGurk today spoke of 120. So this is a problem that's, that's growing, and I would argue, too, it's a problem that we've fundamentally misread. Uh, two examples, which in and of themselves, I think, are uh, quite alarming, is that our adversaries were able to achieve the two most successful attacks against a Western city and commercial aviation in well over a decade. Firstly, at a time when those attacks, I mean, they were completely, at least my understanding from the outside, is that there wasn't the noise or the chatter that we've had in the past suggesting that an attack on Paris was imminent or that a, a bomb would be placed on board a, a Russian passenger jet. Uh, and also, the dominant analytic paradigm at the time, which I think was completely mistaken and had been for, for some time, is that ISIS was only a local threat, had no interest in engaging in international terrorism, and that somehow um, ISIS would remain confined to the perennially violent, unstable Middle East and could somehow uh, be um, boxed in. So those two incidents, I think, were a shock and unfortunately a harbinger. Uh, at least to my knowledge, there still hasn't been the detailed after-action report assessing how the bomb was put on board the Russian airliner and whether that's unique to, admittedly, the very parlous or fragile uh, security that doubtlessly attended Sharm el Sheikh Airport, or whether the terrorist technology has an advance that it can frustrate our protective measures elsewhere. And you know, we just have to look in the United States and TSA and the Inspector General's report from last June where despite, I don't know the exact figure, uh, certainly in the, the tens or hundreds of billions we've spent over the past decade and a half on TSA, and I believe the Inspector General found despite all the nice people, uh, very efficient we know whenever we go to the airport and, and uh, wearing blue shirts, um, only about, they only detected about 5% of the dummy explosives or, or weapons that were attempting to be smuggled on board. So also, we tend to denigrate our opponents, that bomb that blew up on a Somali flight. We say the incompetence uh, there. Well, that's true. The bomber was certainly incompetent, but Again, we don't know exactly how the bot, at least from what I read open source, it was concealed in a computer. But once again, I wonder if we're not with the successful ISIS attack on that Russian airliner looking at a new and increased threat despite all the money we've lavished on aviation security throughout the world and all the personnel uh, that are involved. ISIS has spread. At the end of 2014, they had approximately 500 fighters in Libya. Today, it's more than 10 times that number, and they control the enclave in CERT. Uh, it's poised to take that 150-mile crescent where there are oil fields. In my view, I think, once again, we're misreading the threat. It's not that CERT in Libya is any kind of a fallback uh, to them being dislodged from 
uh, Iraq or Syria, although that's, I think, part of it, uh, that they do have that contingency plan. But I think you look at ISIS propaganda, they see that as the third capital of the caliphate uh, behind Mosul, Raqqa, and, uh, and CERT. So I don't think CERT either will be um, easily taken down. Um, we've relied for the past uh, eight, seven or eight years on an attrition model of terrorism that I think the numbers show it's not working. I mean, we've also relied on the myth of countering violent extremism and counter-radicalization. I mean, 36,500 foreign fighters from throughout the world and that sort of bump from what I, many people thought was, was a very extravagant estimate from the uh, House Homeland Security Committee suggests that a lot of these programs just aren't working or they're being overwhelmed by the flood of people that are being radicalized and recruited. I think the reason is quite simple and is not new. It harkens back to the 1950s and to France Fanon's uh, seminal work, uh, The Wretched of the Earth, which of course was used by left-wing and um, modern-day terrorists in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and 1980s. But it's this message of catharsis, of empowerment, of striking a blow against a hated predatory enemy that I think is rallying this fighting force. That message of, of hatred and the empowerment and catharsis of violence, I think, is very difficult to find a compelling narrative that will push back, um, that will, that will uh, push back against it. And mixed in with that narrative is, of course, one of the oldest and most basest, basest of human emotions, which is the desire for revenge and retaliation, basically for the decade and a half that the war on terrorism has been fought. And its resurgence today provides ample opportunities for the sons, brothers, cousins, nephews of many of the fighters we've killed or imprisoned over the past decade and a half, this new generation, to take up arms and join the battle. And lest you think that's hyperbole, uh, one of the battlefield casualties in Syria last October um, happened to have been the son of Iman Samudra, who was one of the 2002 Bali bombers. That was an Al-Qaeda, Jamal Islamiya operation. Uh, his son, Abdul Aziz, was fighting with ISIS. So I think this is, is, is fueled um, um, this struggle. Dan and I have basically spoken about ISIS, but unfortunately, as the DNI mentioned in his testimony, ISIS is, no, is not the only game in town. And I think a lot of the focus and preoccupation on ISIS, as justified as it is, threatens to leave us vulnerable to a resurgent al-Qaeda. And of course, here there's a very wide divergence within official Washington, within the Beltway, the intelligence community, and policymaking circles um, about the status of Al Qaeda. In my view, Zawahiri is sitting back and letting ISIS take all the heat, very gleefully hoping that the United States and the West exhaust and enervate themselves, and then a resurgent Al Qaeda will reemerge to challenge us once again. Is that fantasy? Well, two years ago, Al Qaeda announced the formation of Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, and Zawahiri said it was two years in the making. In those two years, no one even thought Al-Qaeda was moving along those lines. Its first significant operation was a penetration of the Pakistani military, particularly the Navy, and it was an attempted uh, hijacking of the Zufakar, a uh, Pakistani naval frigate that they intended to sail into the Indian Ocean and attack um, Indian and um, uh, U.S. warships. Uh, they discovered a fatal flaw in the Pakistani um, uh, naval uh, defenses in that the computer systems would not work to target a fellow Pakistani vessel, so it would have been very difficult at least to initially have, have dealt with that um, type of attack. Uh, just in October, if you read the front page of the New York Times, there was a report of what the intelligence community calls the quote-unquote bat cave a 30-kilometer complex of al-Qaeda weaponry that had been stockpiled in the Shorbak district of Kandahar uh, that had been systematically built. I mean, it was pre-9-11 standards in terms, of the, uh, in terms of where the weapons were cached, the bunkers um, carved into the hillsides. Again, it had gone completely unnoticed for 18 months. General Campbell had described that as the largest U.S. Uh, operation, military operation in Afghanistan in two years to basically bring that down. If you read the New York Times article, there's a strong suspicions there's a similar facility somewhere in Helmand province. Uh, my guess, since we've completely missed this one until it had already been established, there may even be uh, more, um, uh, more, than, um, more than that. Um, the, I think two of the problems is that our main metrics for success have been delusional in recent years, or, in, or if not have failed. 
One is the strategy of attrition, this belief that we could decapitate al-Qaeda or um, ISIS. I think they both have deeper benches than we assume. Uh, in my view, not getting into another, uh, uh, another uh, discussion that Dan and I will have, but killing Baghdadi or killing Zawahiri, I mean, that to me would be the surest path to some form of merger or reunification in Washington because Baghdadi himself is a megalomaniac more on the lines of Velopalai Prabhakara, the leader of the LTT, or Pol Pot, than Zawahiri and Bin Laden everywhere, ever wore in the cult of personality he surrounds himself with. He claims a familial lineage back to the prophets, so he's more difficult, it's more difficult to replace him than arguably other leaders, but that doesn't mean ISIS would go away. I think it would be uh, susceptible to being merged, or I think it has the depth to carry on the struggle. Certainly Al-Qaeda has a much uh, deeper bench than, than we've often imagined. And many of the senior leaders of the movement today are individuals who first cut their teeth fighting against the Red Army in Afghanistan 30 years ago. Also, I think Al-Qaeda very wisely in this remaking of itself has turned much more to South Asia. I mean, India, after all, is the world's second largest Muslim population. Um, in Al-Qaeda's view, it's an un our focus on the Middle East and focus on ISIS has presented an opening for them. And just over the past year, year and a half, Al-Qaeda has certainly made more inroads in radicalization and recruitment in the Maldives and in Burma and even resurfacing back in Indonesia. That in and of itself is profoundly depressing because, at least in my view, in, to the extent that I can see a, a half glass full, I would have said only a few months ago that Indonesia was the unequivocal, unqualified success in the war on terrorism, where Unit 88, their very efficient counter-terrorist unit, their own rehabilitation program and counter-radicalization program have been remarkably successful in completely dismantling Jamal Islamiyah. But now we see uh, not just Al-Qaeda resurfacing in Indonesia, but last month there was the attack on, the local, on, the, on a local Starbucks that shows that ISIS now, even a very modest attack, but nonetheless one that has, um, that, 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 uh, um, shook many people up, and I think rightly so. Our second metric, which we're also failing, is thinking that hosts, we can train up and build up host nation forces to themselves confront uh, this menace. We've had serial failures in Mali a few years ago, that three years ago, that precipitated the French intervention. But Afghanistan, Iraq, and Yemen stand as failures. Yemen only last year was being touted as one of the successes. Uh, so where does that leave us, and, and what do we do? Well. For me, the biggest problem is that we've gone beyond terrorism with some of these groups, with ISIS, with Jabhat al-Nusra. Uh, and by the way, I, have, uh, I had a piece a few months ago that bin Laden would be very happy if he was alive today. Uh, in 1998, in an interview, uh, bin Laden said that he didn't fear death, that he welcomed his martyrdom because he was confident that his death would produce thousands of more Osamas. Certainly, this proliferation of foreign fighters has uh, enabled him in death to realize his dream. If you recall from some of the Abbottabad documents, Bin Laden was very concerned that people had the wrong idea about Al-Qaeda and that he wanted to rebrand it in his dying days. Well, of course, Jabhat al-Nusra, al-Sham, and other groups are proof that Al-Qaeda has rebranded re itself. And we don't refer to it as, uh, as Al-Qaeda in Syria, but many people now tend to look at uh, Jabhat al-Nusra as a moderate alternative to um, ISIS. It's a wolf in, if, if that even does exist, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing or a wolf, in, a wolf in coyote's clothing. But I think the problem is that the challenge, whether it's in Syria, Iraq, or Yemen, has gone beyond terrorism. We're confronted by adversaries that are, in essence, hybrid forces that are able to engage in international terrorism, harness the power of insurgency on a local level, but also, in many instances, are able to deploy conventional military tactics. And we certainly saw that when ISIS stormed into um, Iraq in the summer of 2014. If we face a hybrid threat that's gone above terrorism, decapitation alone won't work. But also, this is not amenable to either airstrikes or to direct action by special operations forces. Um, airstrikes, we already know that ISIS completely changed the way it was operating within two weeks of the coalition airstrikes two years ago. Dispersed, had a much lighter uh, footprint. Um, it's been damaged of that, there's no doubt. But I think this is the point. The president is quite right, and we always say terrorism doesn't pose an existential threat. Thank God it doesn't. 
and most of the time in history it hasn't either. But what terrorism is all about is a war of attrition. It's designed to enervate, undermine, weaken one's, one's opponents. And from the terrorist point of view, they're growing and expanding in numbers. Uh, they have more sanctuaries and safe havens than they've had before. ISIS is a local threat. It has official branches or provinces in eight different countries, and at least according to David Ignatius's column from a couple of weeks ago, has 50 affiliates in 21 countries. It's not, it's not um, a, 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 lo a local threat. And in this sense, I think that a hybrid threat eventually has to be countered with some military force somewhere. Uh, who's going to do it and where they're going to do it is the big question, but um, just before where I was having a discussion with Har Harlan Ullman, I mean, it's astonishing to think the Japanese Navy, which is basically a pacifistic military force, is twice as large as the Royal Navy. Um, the United States Marine Corps, the smallest of our combatant services, is larger than the entirety of the British military. Britain was the go-to country for us. So our options, admittedly, are severely limited at a time when the threat is worsening. And then I'll stop and say, I've told you all about the numbers of terrorists going up. What about U.S. capabilities? The Army is slated to shrink by 100,000 persons to about 420,000 ground forces as opposed to half a million. So a rising threat and diminishing capabilities, and the question is how we will interdict and intervene to arrest this uh, very disturbing pattern. Okay, thank you very much. I thought this was a really great beginning. Uh, so we're going to turn it over to uh, uh, questions and answers. Uh, again, I want to remind you that it's on the record and uh, uh, it's being videoed uh, on webcasts. Uh, please wait for the microphone uh, before you ask your question. Identify yourself uh, if you could, please. Uh, and please keep your questions short and uh, concise. Let's not have any extended op-eds, uh, you know, in this session here, because we only have 25 minutes to go. So, and indicate who you are directing your question to, please. Okay, Harley? Uh, thanks. I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlantic Council. First, I think you're both right. Good presentations. My question has to do with the contradictions that really get to the heart of the problem. Uh, terrorist Islamic State are obviously attacking the heart of democracy by putting security against uh, rights and the notion of liberal democracy. Uh, they're winning the cost exchange ratio. What does it cost us to take them on? What is it costing them? Um, and the real contradiction is that the United States sees the threat as existential in the region. Why have we been so unsuccessful in, conven in convincing the regional states, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and others, that the Islamic State is indeed existential to them? What do we do to take that on? Because it seems to me, unless we can convince our so-called friends and allies that this is a real threat to them, we're never going to get to resolving the situation to any sort of betterment. Um, I'll start. Uh, I, I think many of our allies do not see the Islamic State as an existential threat. And from their point of view, often correctly so. Right? It, and it's a, it's a definitional question in some ways of what is existential. But if you look at the Iraqi instance, for example, you have a government that is primarily concerned about consolidating its political position within the Shia community. And only secondarily committed to the question of a unified, uh, stable Iraq. And so the question of should they make political concessions to the Sunni community to bring them into an Iraqi state, sure, like, I'll recommend that till the cows come home, right? But there are understandable political reasons they haven't done so because they're playing to certain constituencies within their own power base. And this is a common trend in the developing world, which is they are balancing internal and external security. And they are often willing to live with, with a much higher level of domestic conflict than we would think of as appropriate. Right? So for many countries, having a limited threat is normal. And in a few cases, having a limited threat where the United States will, and the world will pour, will pour resources into helping them is actually not a bad thing. And so I think they, would, uh, they are simply prioritizing. Um, in Saudi Arabia, I think they believe that they can ride this one out. Right, that they're radicals, and the radicals will pose a limited terrorism threat, but they're better off focusing on other problems. They're much more concerned about the Iranians. Right? Now, I actually think that's a mistake. I think that this is a bigger deal than they are they're saying, but I don't think their threat perception is illogical. I just happen to disagree with it. Well, 
I would say one of our best allies, or at least the most capable of fighting ISIS, are the Kurds. And they certainly think ISIS is an existential threat. And the Peshmerga and uh, to, you know, YPG as well have demonstrated capabilities that established nation states or a willingness to engage ISIS that established nation states have it. I'm not a Middle Eastern expert, uh, or at least there was a time when I pretended to be uh, a terrorism specialist, so I'm looking narrowly at the threat posed by ISIS. But when I look at the problems with some of the countries you named, and it's Iran. I mean, we have a divergent view of what the major regional threat is. We can argue that it's ISIS, but to Saudi Arabia, to many of the Gulf states, uh, to Israel, it's Iran. And that's, I think, part of the complications that makes it very difficult to find uh, you know, groups other than the Kurds to actually send forces to, uh, to, to, to Syria or Iraq, to, to, or Iraq in particular, to engage ISIS, especially when you know, Saudi Arabia is prosecuting and not entirely successful. I'm not sure what you would call it, but campaign against, uh, against ISIS and other groups in Yemen. And that, that's, that's, part, that's part of the problem. I mean, Jordan, of course, sees this as an existential threat of that. I think there's no doubt. It's very small forces that have limited uh, deployment. I mean, it, you know, it, at the end of the day, I think it's, you know, it's, 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 it's not just political will, but it's, it's who we can count on in the region to actually deploy the ground forces that are going to be needed to force ISIS out of Mosul, for example. I think Mosul is going to be a lot more difficult to take than al was. Okay. Yeah. Do we? Thank you. Um, my name is Dimitar Georgiev, uh, formerly a student of uh, both Professor Byman and Professor Hoffman's, and uh, I'm at the Crumpton Group uh, today. Um, Professor Hoffman, you mentioned ISIS is in eight countries with 50 affiliates in 21 countries. And we talk about on the news about Syria and Iraq, Libya, but what countries would you say, and Professor Byman, please, uh, I would love to hear your opinion on this as well. What countries should we be paying attention to that we're not paying attention to now, vis-a-vis -vis well, ISIS? Right now, Libya, and there's I mean, another enormously complicated problem with two factional governments, with the with at least the internationally recognized government being forced having been forced out of the capital as well. But obviously, Libya, I think, is 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 a huge problem in terms of uh, the you know its proximity to Europe. Um, in terms of ISIS in a very short span of time, having consolidated its position as much as a terrorist group can consolidate its position and hold territory. Uh, but I think you have to start with, I mean, the first step in diminishing ISIS's allure or its attraction, I think is first and foremost pushing it out of Iraq. And the longer it's able to sit in Iraq and the longer it's able to exercise sovereignty, the more it's going to be a beacon to foreign fighters. I mean, it has to be dealt, I think, a decisive military blow. Again, the question is who's going to do that, when. But waiting now until the spring, which is the latest estimate I've seen from, from CENCOM, when, when Mosul might be retaken. I mean, every day that a terrorist group is in power and is able to exercise that authority is a way that it's able to attract more fighters and to pursue its overall agenda. I mean, one reason why I think ISIS poses a threat that's not regional is that its ideology is identical to al-Qaeda's. There's absolutely no difference. The difference is in timing when the caliphate could have been declared. So Wahari preferred it was after foreign corrupt influences were cleansed uh, from, from the region. Baghdadi said, why wait? And also there was a difference whether you attack the far enemy first, which for al-Qaeda hasn't been succeeding as a policy, or Baghdadi was go after the near enemy, but that doesn't mean he doesn't think about the far enemy. Just think of the name of their online magazine, Dabiq. I mean, that's where this epic battle between the forces of light and darkness will be fought in Syria, which means that they are looking beyond a, a regional threat. And why, I think, taking down ISIS is enormously important. You, I don't think they can be contained. Syria's a different problem, but getting them out of Iraq and doing so expeditiously is absolutely critical. Yeah. Go on. Oh, okay. Pass? Okay. Uh, Mark, I think, believe? Yeah. Yes, thanks. Uh, Mark Fitzpatrick, Executive Director of the uh, U.S. Uh, office here. Thanks very much, uh, Don, subbing uh, for us today. I was doing another event across town. This might be a question for Dan, but maybe it's a question for the half-glass empty uh, half of the equipment. 
I was living in London when um, last uh, year there was a political cry in hue that uh, we've got to stop immigration until we can figure out what's going on because uh, uh, there might be terrorists uh, uh, masquerading as uh, as refugees. And uh, I was living in Europe, which were you know. Thousands of times more refugees were coming to their, uh, crossing their borders, and there wasn't a, a similar uh, cry that they had to stop them. I guess, Dan, when you mentioned the, the number of people that have been uh, assigned to the task of following jihadists, do we understand what's going on? Can, I mean, would you answer that question about whether we really need to, to take steps to stop all immigration from, uh, from certain uh, uh, kinds of people or certain countries uh, until we can figure out that none of them are going to uh, attack us with terrorism? I, I, will, I will say I have a, not a bias is the right word, but I have a strong personal view that um, kind of wealthy, civilized countries have a responsibility to help refugees uh, fleeing political violence. And so to me, that, that colors my response in general. So I just want to kind of make you aware of that as I think about this. Uh, what I've argued on the refugee issue is that the threat, if you will, is misunderstood. I think that the idea of planting sleeper agents among refugees, especially to the United States, is, is more on the fanciful side. Um, in the United States, they're, they're scrutinized to some degree. Every process is imperfect. But it's just an inefficient way, frankly, uh, to do this. Um, but there are a couple possibilities, right? Some of these people could radicalize on their own, right? So they could go through every background test and then radicalize on their own. Um, uh, or come here and, over time, radicalize. Uh, I am much more concerned on the European side, but not with you know the ISIS is sending out dangerous people, but rather that the refugee communities will have, to me, the worst of all worlds, which is they'll be welcomed and then shunned. Right? So they'll be brought in in a fit of kind of you know warmth and generosity, and then they'll be demonized politically and ex excluded economically. And who will be the ones providing the services? Then it will be parts of the European Muslim community that actually is radicalized. Right? I mean, there are parts that there is a serious problem in several elements of you know, the European Muslim community. And so I'm worried that this is actually a longer-term problem, not caused by these are terrorists coming to our shores, but neglect of this community could lead some to embrace violence, to not be integrated into those countries. And so ironically, I think this is something that is incredibly amenable to a policy response. Right, that if we do this right, we can uh, reduce this problem. And there was a event at Brookings where this was discussed where um, the European, the U.S. problem in some ways is a resource problem where people are brought in and we don't support refugees with considerable resources. The European problem is an integration problem where they'll often give a remarkable amount of resources to refugees coming in. And then once they've given the resources, they'll kind of treat them as second class citizens for the rest of their time and for their children's time. Right? And America actually is really good at this. Right? This is like an amazing national strength is integrating different communities. And I'd like to see us kind of be proud of that and expand on this rather than treat this as a danger. The caveat being that inevitably, as in any community coming to the United States, there will be some bad, dangerous people. Right? When Cuban refugees came in, when uh, Mexican uh, immigrants have come in, we've seen, of course, we've seen gang members, we've seen drug traffickers. And we have law enforcement services and FBI's to deal with this and focus on this, and there will be some, right? So I'm very nervous about the standard being zero because I think it's very bad for the United States. Yeah, hey, the gentleman over here, and then we'll go to the gentleman here in the third row. Thanks, Ted Voorhees, Covington and Berlin. My question comes from the phrase you hear from time to time: "We love death more than you love life." And my question refers to, it relates to martyrdom. And if you just say a few words about this. Is this something new that we're seeing? And this is the ability to deploy large numbers of people who actually welcome the opportunity to die so long as it's associated with a mass casualty situation. Is this something new? And whether it is new or not, do you see us doing anything in particular about addressing what seems to me a really quite horrific um, method of war. The first and greatest study on suicide bombing was actually Bruce's, so let me defer to the question. <laughs> um, no, and that suggests it's, it's not new. Um, I mean, there were, there were always terrorist operations, even in the past. I mean, 
A, a strict definition of suicide terrorism is that the death of the perpetrator is necessary to ensure the success of, of, of the mission. But there always been terrorist missions in the past where there's an extremely high likelihood of, of death. The Palestinian Fedayeen operations in the 1970s against Israel in particular had certain suicidal elements as well. So I don't think it's terribly new. And in fact, this morning I'm uh, trying to write the third edition of Inside Terrorism. And I went back and was looking at um, the events before the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo. And in fact, uh, Maladna Bosna, the young Bosnians, um, had staged two suicide terrorist operations in attempting to kill senior Habsburg officials. So, you know, it, that's the fascinating thing about terrorism is that nothing is, ter is terribly new. Certainly it's on a much more sustained level. Um, where I think the biggest risk in suicide terrorist operations are is that they're, from the terrorist point of view, a lot easier to stage because there's no exfiltration problem. So immediately whatever resources may have been dedicated to facilitating an escape can be now be focused on an effective terrorist operation. And if you look at Paris, I mean, the, the most worrisome thing, and this, this goes to the refugee question as well, probably the most wanted man in the entirety of Europe was uh, Abdul Hamid Aboud, right, who was somehow in the issue of Dabiq as well, taunted the French authorities that he had been in and out of France at least a couple of times. And it's that ability to mount operations, even, and the French, I think, it's very much of an example of having had a vast expansion of their counterterrorism machinery, certainly of all the European countries. I would rate the French as probably the most capable. Certainly their laws and their authorities exceed almost any other country, certainly the United States, in countering the terrorist threat. So firstly, I would have thought France was a hard target Brussels or you know Belgium or another country may have been easier, but ISIS went after a very hard target. And then even the entirety of the French uh, intelligence bureaucracy looking for a boot, he's still able to come in and out, still able to plan this attack. And that I think becomes you know it's 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 their ability to have penetrated society and have the infrastructure in place. That's the most worrisome dimension, not just the suicide terrorism, but that's certainly a part of it. Uh, let me add just one thing briefly. Uh, we're seeing a scale that we haven't seen before. And when I look at the Islamic State, they're using suicide bombers, if you want to call them that, uh, as part of conventional warfare tactics. Right? And so this is quite remarkable to me that you know, when you're trying to take a fortified position, you deploy you know, four suicide bombers here, they blow a hole in the defenses, and other forces pour through, right? the way you might use armor in a different context. And it's the if you go back to the 1990s, right, in the uh, Israeli-Palestinian context, you know, a few of these suicide bombings led to international conferences, right? And now it's, we just call it Thursday, right? It's just something that's a normal part of warfare. So I think we're seeing a normalization of this to the point where groups can use it in different ways, where it's not just the kind of high-value shock targets, but really much more mundane uses of this simply because they have lots of capacity in this area. The gentleman in the second row, and the, the gentleman in the second row over here first, please. And then we'll go to the gentleman in the back and the lady. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, I have a, a simple doubt. I'm wondering why ISIS didn't attack uh, Jerusalem or Israel yet. I mean, I don't want to they attack, but I'm wondering why they didn't do that regarding to the last question. True. Your opinion, your expert opinion. Because sometimes I ask gossip, but yeah, that I would like to know. Sure. Is there is an answer of that regarding this, this topic? Yeah. Well, there's never been a successful Al Qaeda attack against That's Israel right. either, and of course, Bin Laden has right. railed against Israel and the Jews, you know, for uh, you know long, long before 9/11. Uh, I think mean, again, it's it's a reflection of ISIS's strategy, which is predominantly take on the near enemy first, solidify its position, and then expand and take on. The far, the far enemy, or the far enemies, in, in, including, of course, Israel. Um, uh, and, and I mean, they're not far in Dara, places in southern Syria. I mean, they're not that far from the, from the, Golan, uh, from the Golan Heights. But I think it's, 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 it's a sequential approach. Um, I'll add two things. Uh, one is the, the quality and presence of the Israeli security services is, is part of it. But a big one, strangely enough, is Hamas. Um, if you are a Palestinian angry at the Israelis, you have a group to join. Right? If you want to do an attack, you have a group to join. Um, and part of the problem, if you will, in a strange way, is that um, there are challenges to Hamas now. 
And so Hamas doesn't have the monopoly on violence that it wants. And some of these challenges come from the more radical edge of the jihadist spectrum. So whether it's groups more affiliated with al-Qaeda or groups affiliated with the Islamic State. And so in a strange way, Hamas has been both a diversion for these groups and a barrier to it. Um, and so I think there are a number of things going on in addition to Bruce's points. Wait, and Hamas has acted very forthrightly against right. Salafi groups trying to organize right. in, in Gaza. I mean, you're right. using you know, pretty, pretty significant force right. against them as well. Absolutely. Uh, the gentleman from VOA in the back there. Yeah, I think that lady first. Yes. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, like 11 years, I am waiting for the opportunity to meet uh, Bruce and Dan. Yeah, thanks so much. And I have a, I am a, I am Aso Jabbar from the VOA, from the Kurdish service. I have a two question about the, the conflict resolution uh, before ISIS was uh, so strong to resolve those uh, conflicts in Iraq and Syria. Now the conflict resolution process in the Syria and Iraq now is worst. Do you think is uh, that is, is a question? And the other question is um, now uh, the Kurdish fighters in uh, Syria and the Kurdish fight Peshmerga in uh, Iraq, north of Iraq, the Kurdish Kurdistan region, fighting strongly. Uh, fighting strongly the ISIS against ISIS, uh, but now the Turkish government uh, killed the people on the border by the bombing and more things like that. And uh, do you see, uh, what's your opinion about why the USA don't say anything about situation? Yes, thanks so much. Um, I, I think I mean to me that's actually relatively straightforward, which is the United States doesn't want to be caught between allies with different agendas. Right? So it's working the Kurdish forces in Syria, of course, tremendously important to the US efforts uh, in Syria. And Turkey is an incredibly important ally of the United States. And so, you know, sometimes when your friends are fighting, you try to stay out of it, actually, rather than come down strongly on one side or the other. And I'm sure the US has opinions on various aspects and does things more quietly, but there's a, a reluctance to risk alienating one side or the other. Um, very briefly on the conflict resolution, you know, there, are, there are 50 problems with US negotiation efforts. Uh, but an obvious one is that we have different interests than US allies, right? For US allies and for uh, the, whether it's local allies, such as the fires in Syria, or whether it's uh, countries like Turkey or countries like Saudi Arabia, <laughs> the focus is on the Assad regime and what they feel is the Iranian puppet master. For the United States, it's the Islamic State. So we just have a very different orientation on what we care about, which makes it very, very hard to have a successful diplomatic resolution to this because you end up in a very different place than the people you're supposed to be working with, let alone your adversaries. Well, I would say with, with, with Turkey, it's, it could be a one-word answer, insulic. I mean, that's, that's the main reason. You, for whatever U.S. policy is projected in the region, you depend very heavily on the air base there, on the basing rights of the country. NATO, so, uh, you know, that's really central. I mean, looking at the, you know, the conflict resolution, I think this is what at least I find personally so frustrating is, you know, six or seven years ago we were there. I mean, you know, colossal foreign policy blunder to have invaded Iraq, but at least at the end of it, we were seen as, we were seen as one of the only external forces that could at least assuage Sunni concerns in Western Iraq. Um, and our brokering, at least, of you know, holding Iraq together was enormously important. But unfortunately, I think you know, our, our withdrawal and then that region's, and especially Iraq's, descent into much sharper sectarianism and factionalism means that that's broken apart. I mean, again, I'm a terrorism specialist, not, not someone who's a foreign policy expert. But you know, what seems obvious is that ISIS's biggest achievement, we could debate how consequential or inconsequential they are, but the one thing that they did is they redrew the, the boundaries in that region. They dissolved the Sykes-Picot borders, and I wonder if they can be reestablished anymore. And then you have to ask what different sort of constellation of borders is going to emerge from this. And that's actually ISIS's goal, but I think, unfortunately, they're successful in posing their aims and goals on the region now. Okay, I think we have time for only two more questions. The lady over here, and then the gentleman up front here, then the fourth row. And if we can get to you, sir, we will. We'll just see how the timing looks. Thank you for taking my question. Jody Vittori from Georgetown University, or, or 
excuse me, Georgetown University and an uh, advocacy group called Global Witness. I wanted to ask about, uh, Dr. Hoffman, some of your statements about the fact of U.S. support and military support building foreign forces overseas, and also the fact of these, these governments working on local constituencies. We've, we've been dumping equipment into places with a very corrupt governments, delegitimate government, governments, um, very exclusive political economies in these states who have primarily used a violence approach to dealing with these conflicts and actually have closed the nonviolent civil society space in these locations. Um, to build off on the larger conflict resolution question, how does this sort of end in this situation and is there a way we can get to some sort of longer term conflict resolution with certain policy goals or advice or whatever in the region? Thank you. Okay. And can we have this gentleman's question? We'll just take it both at the same time, if we could. So the gentleman in the second row, please. And then we'll have to stop there. Thank you, John Baker with uh, Innovative Analytics. Uh, we've covered an awful lot, and you've done a wonderful job, uh, as usual. Uh, but I noticed that we didn't have any mention of a couple topics. One was anything about uh, terrorism and weapons of mass destruction, and the other one is on cyber. Uh, there might be a good reason for that, but I just thought I'd put, put that out for discussion and whether you wanted to comment on it, whether it, it's less relevant in the current context or just something that hadn't been brought up. Thank you. Okay. Well, I agree, uh, going back to uh, the question about um, building up civil society and that, you know, the United States had provision of military aid, which was really being a, you know, a dry hole. I mean, I agree with you completely. We, we can't keep doing the same things. It's not working. It hasn't worked in Yemen, Iraq, and Afghanistan. So whether it's John Noggle's suggestion of an advisory corps of 20,000 soldiers, uh, but it's, we've got to do something differently. Right now, uh, you know, my analysis of the situation is that, as I said before, until you militarily diminish ISIS, you can't begin any of these other processes, that ISIS has elbowed itself and sucked in all the oxygen, even at the, extent, uh, even at the expense of paying attention to, as the DNI said, a rising al-Qaeda threat, even to the extent of paying any attention to Iranian force projection throughout the region. And the, I mean, it's not just Sunni militias that are the big problem in the region. I mean, Shia militias are, are, are active all over and also gaining uh, invaluable combat uh, experience as well. But I think it's got to be, somehow ISIS has to be taken down. Then we can have a view of how to rebuild it. But part of it, I think, is just taking a systematic look at what's not working now. And across the board, again, as a terrorism analyst, there's not much that's really working. I mean, the one thing that is working, and this is important, is that the decapitation strategy and the high-value targeting has been effective at disrupting and derailing immediate plots to the homeland and elsewhere. Absolutely no doubt. But again, go back to my earlier point. Of course, this isn't an existential struggle. It's a war of attrition. And we're, I think, confusing our ability to tactically interdict terrorists with having an overall long-term positive strategic effect. We don't want to be fighting this for another 15 years. I mean, think of it this way. We've been talking about Al-Qaeda's, Al-Qaeda alone, their strategic collapse since 2011. Right now, that's longer than it took us to defeat Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. So their strategy is to constantly draw this out, and that's why I think an approach of escalation um, is going to play into their hands. So militarily, they have to be defeated. Again, I don't know who's going to do it. I have my own ideas, but that's a different uh, story. To John's uh, question, you know, I don't want to be completely depressing, so I left out WMD. And WMD, of course, is a, is a catchphrase. Uh, two points. Uh, firstly, look at the DNA's testimony and also John Brennan's testimony to the, to the Senate Armed Services Committee. ISIS is developing a chemical capability, even in addition to whatever, you know, embryonic stockpiles of mustard or chlorine gas it may have seized from Assad or other regions. But certainly they have the interest. Um, going back already over two years ago, coincidentally, completely separate plots were, uh, that's the trouble too, is we only pay attention to, this has always historically been the case, we pay attention to the successes and we forget about what's being disrupted. And those often, I think, provide enormous insight into terrorist motivations, interests, and capabilities. Already in 2014, both ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra were developing sarin nerve gas capability. Um, with Jabhat al-Nusra, I suspect it was more advanced and 
uh, a cell was broken up in Italia. This is completely legitimate. This is not, you know, alarmist. Another cell, coincidentally, actually there were two different groups in Baghdad were arrested. Their sarin nerve gas, I think, was a lot less sophisticated, but they were trying to develop chlorine and mustard gas. I think terrorists understand that those aren't weapons of mass destruction, but, and I know you'd understand they're not too, but the question is they're often categorized in that way, and terrorists know that an unconventional weapon attack will have profound psychological repercussions that go beyond the actual number of deaths and the actual attack themselves. So I would say that's their interest. It's not WMD, but it's the psychological blow. So clearly, in a nascent or embryonic sense, many of the adversaries in the Middle East were already demonstrating interest. Chemical makes sense. It's the simplest. I think, though, what worries me in the long term is that terrorists, as we learned from al-Qaeda in Afghanistan before 9-11, are the most dangerous when they have sanctuary and safe haven. And I'm not talking about the plot uh, against Washington and New York on 9-11. I'm talking about what we no now know were multiple compartmented programs to develop anthrax, biological weapons, chemical weapons. And then, you know, look at George Tenen Tenen's book, At the Center of the Storm. He's extremely explicit that of course, Al-Qaeda's actual capabilities in a nuclear way were even not even in the half-baked, in the quarter, even the eighth-baked. But nonetheless, they were serious. I'm not suggesting by any stretch of the imagination they were anywhere ever close. But just the fact that they were thinking about uh, along those lines. We know Al-Qaeda from the 1990s was thinking of Mahmoud Salah. One of Bin Laden's uh, uh, lieutenants was sent to try to buy... Um, Fissile materials off the, mm -hmm. I mean, was, like many people, was ripped off with red mercury. But the point is, they certainly have the interest. And what worries me is any time terrorist groups have ac access to sanctuary and safe haven, they can start to think big. And there's already the indications. I'm not saying we're anywhere close to that point, but it's another reason why these groups have to be deprived of those safe spaces. Dan, you get to have the last word. Sure, I'll, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, just to address the point on, on the cyber issue. Uh, this is something that jihadist groups in general have not focused on. Uh, I would think of it in terms of they have attracted roughly, you know, whatever figure you might use, let's say 35,000 foreign fighters. And most of those are young males. And so what can that demographic reasonably achieve? Right? And some of these people are quite well educated. But relatively few are, you know, advanced um, uh, software engineers that would, you know, get the job in Silicon Valley. So it's likely to be the kind of lower level harassment attacks that are available uh, to people who without particular skills. So I think in general they'll lag on this one, but a lot will depend on uh, capacity that falls into their lap. Um, most of what they want from technical people is to help run the Islamic State. But that said, they will take advantage of offensive capability. A lot of their social media, which people make a very big deal of, um, in my view, is actually not particularly good. It's just what you get when you have a bunch of young people who are trained in social media. Right? The people who are saying it's awesome tend to be people my generation who are kind of amazed by Twitter or something like that, right? But it's, it's roughly comparable to what my, you know, my kids can do and their high school can do, right? It's fine, but it's not this overwhelmingly amazing machine that has produced this juggernaut, right? It's simply a lot of quantity and a lot of uh, current capacity. And that's a relatively common trend we see in terrorism, which is a clever use of existing capacity. Right, where it's rare that they're breaking new ground in terms of technology, but they're often using existing technologies in unexpected ways. Okay, thank you very, very much. We really want to appreciate uh, a really great session. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you.